what happens in John, and, uh, and compare the list. And it's actually quite striking when you do this with the resurrection narratives. Because, well, who, who is it that goes to the tomb? Is it Mary Magdalene by herself or Mary with other women? If other women, how many other women? And what are their names? It depends which gospel you read. What do they find there? Is the stone rolled away already or is it not rolled away uh, already? Depends which gospel you read. What do they, who do they see there? Do they see a man there as in Mark? Do they see two men there as in Luke? Or do they see an angel as in Matthew? Depends which gospel you read. What are they told? Are they told to tell the disciples to meet Jesus in Galilee or are they told to tell the disciples to stay in Jerusalem? Do they go tell the disciples? It depends whether you read Mark or whether you read Matthew and Luke. If they do tell the disciples, what do the disciples do? Do they go to Galilee or do they stay in Jerusalem? It depends which gospel you read. I mean, you just, you just go down the line and, it, and, it's, and it's different. And that's how you get if you, if you read these stories against each other. Well, if you do that in the story of the crucifixion, in Mark and Luke, you come up with very, very different portrayals. The significance of that, the significance of that is not just, that, oh, okay, it's, well, there are discrepancies. Yeah, there are discrepancies, but that isn't the point. The point is that if you want to know what Mark has to say, you have to read Mark and not pretend he's saying the same thing as Luke because they're different. And so Mark has to stand on its own as a literary production. In Mark's gospel, when Jesus is being crucified, uh, in fact, it's a, it's a very gripping scene. In Mark's gospel, Jesus doesn't say anything uh, while he's being led to the place of crucifixion. While he's being crucified, he's completely silent. When he's hanging on the cross, he's mocked by uh, the Jewish leaders by the people who are passing by in front of him, he's mocked by both robbers in Mark's gospel. Jesus doesn't say anything until the end in Mark's gospel. At the end, he cries out, Eloi, Eloi, lama sabachthani, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? And he dies. That's it. That's Mark. A very, it's very powerful and gripping. And, but people don't realize that this, because people think Jesus said all sorts of other things on the cross. Well, why do they think that? Because they've read Matthew, and they've read Luke, and they've read John, and they end up with the seven last words of the dying Jesus, which are found in not one of the Gospels, but by smashing all of the Gospels together into one big, big Gospel. Now, it's perfectly legitimate to do that if you want to do that. If you want to read the Gospels and smash them all together so they're all right and they're all saying the same thing, but you have to realize that if you're doing that, you're writing your own Gospel. And you're making it say something that's different from any of the Gospels of the New Testament. Okay, so I mean, that's, that's the effect of doing that. In Luke's gospel, Jesus is not silent. He's not silent on the way to be crucified. He sees women weeping for him, and he, and he turns to them and he says, uh, Daughters of Jerusalem, don't weep for me. Weep for yourselves and for your children, for the fate that's to befall you. He's more concerned about these women than himself in Luke's gospel. In Luke's gospel, he's not quiet while he's uh, being nailed to the cross. He prays, Father, forgive them, for they don't know what they're doing. While he's hanging on the cross, he actually has an intelligent conversation with one of the robbers. The one guy accuses, the one guy maligns Jesus. The other robber says to the other person to, to, to be quiet because Jesus hasn't done anything to deserve this. And then he turns to Jesus and says, Lord, remember me when you come into your kingdom. And Jesus says, truly I tell you, today you will be with me in paradise. Jesus knows exactly what's happening to him in Luke's gospel. Not in Mark, but in Luke, he knows exactly what's happening to him. He knows what's going to happen to him after it happens to him. He's going to wake up in paradise, and this guy's going to be next to him. And at the end, the most telling thing of all is that Jesus, instead of crying out, My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? He doesn't say that in Luke. What he says is, Father, into your hands I commend my spirit. And he dies. In Luke's gospel, Jesus is completely in control of the situation. He knows what's going on. He knows why it's going on, unlike Mark, where he seems to be in doubt. This, passage, this verse about, Father, forgive them, for they don't know what they're doing, is a very interesting verse. In early Christianity, this verse was interpreted not as a prayer of forgiveness for the Romans who were crucifying him. It was interpreted as a prayer for the Jews who had turn Jesus over to the authorities. Jesus is asking for forgiveness for the Jewish people in the interpretation of the early Christian interpreters of the passage. That makes it striking that in some manuscripts from, uh, the, early dec and from, the, er from the early years, this prayer is omitted by some scribes. Why would scribes take that lovely verse out? 
Well, it should be obvious why they took it out. They took it out because they interpreted it as a prayer of forgiveness for Jews, and these scribes didn't think God had ever forgiven the Jews. In the second and third centuries, Christians started saying that Jews are guilty for the killing of Christ, and that, in fact, the destruction of the city of Jerusalem in the year 70 by the Roman armies was a punishment by God given to the Jewish people for rejecting their own Messiah. In the second and third centuries, we have Christians who are saying that Jesus was God, so that when Jews, they would say, when Jews are responsible for the death of Jesus, uh, we have some authors saying Jews are guilty of deicide. Jews have killed God, and God held them responsible. What's a scribe who thinks that going to do with his prayer of forgiveness? He's going to take it out, and that's exactly what happens. Some of our early manuscripts are missing the prayer. They're missing it because scribes have changed it for reasons of their own. These are some of the big differences uh, that you can find in the New Testament manuscripts, and there are all sorts of differences that you find. Some are related to theological disputes of early Christianity, where scribes would change the text and make it coincide more closely with their own theological views. Some of these changes have to do with relationships of Christians and Jews. Some of these changes have to do with Christian understandings of women. Uh, there continue to be debates today in churches, Christian churches, about whether women should have leadership roles. Well, these, uh, these debates often hinge on verses that have been changed by scribes. You can guess which way scribes changed these verses. In the second and third centuries, when, when women's roles were being suppressed, uh, all of a sudden manuscripts start showing up in which women are told to be silent in the churches. Uh, this is a, the sort of change that, that uh, scribes made. The textual critic is somebody who tries to deal with this phenomenon of manuscripts that have so many changes in them. There are actually two things that a textual critic, critic does. One thing that is, uh, of course, primary importance is to figure out what an author actually wrote. Because you can't interpret an author, whether you're talking about Plato or Aristophanes or Homer or Mark or Matthew or Luke or John, you can't interpret what an author said unless you, you can't interpret what he said unless you know what he said. You've got to have his words, and so textual critics try to reconstruct to the best of their ability what an author actually wrote. A textual critic also, though, is interested in knowing why the text got changed. Why did scribes change the text? I mean, you know, it's interesting to see that sometimes they fell asleep, but beyond that, what kind of theological motivations were there for changing the text? What kind of ideological influence was, were affecting these scribes? When we know more of that kind of information, we're better able to understand both the scribes and their own historical context as people living in the early centuries, especially the early centuries, a time period about which we have very little information about Christianity otherwise. Thank you very much.